Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we are continuing our discussion of cardiac physiology. This is recording part eight. Now let's move on to some more anatomy of the heart, specifically the coronary circulation. The heart muscle receives its blood supply not from the blood inside the heart chambers, but from the coronary arteries that lie on the surface of the heart, and then smaller arteries that penetrate deep into the cardiac muscle. But virtually no delivery of nutrients to heart muscles comes from blood inside the heart. Let's just see a few features of these figures here. We see the left coronary artery. Um, actually, it starts out as a left main and branches off into a circumflex and then the left coronary artery. And this is showing the left circumflex kind of coming behind the heart and the left, the left coronary artery coming down. There's also a right coronary artery coming down this way. Looking at the other side of the heart, uh, we can see behind the heart is that left. Or now we're behind, and this is the front of the heart, uh, where there's that left main branching into the left coronary. And here's the circumflex, circumflex branch of the left coronary coming around the back of the heart um, and almost meeting up with uh, uh, this branch of the right coronary artery coming over here. The coronary arteries originate from the coronary aortic sinuses. This is a picture of the top of the heart. So here you can see the coronary, uh, sorry, the aortic valve. And if we cut through the aortic valve, and each of these is one of the three valve leaflets. So we are standing sort of outside the heart. We're like in the aorta, and below is the chamber of the left ventricle. So there are tiny little holes here that send blood to the right and the left coronary. We call this the non-coronary cusp because it doesn't have any sinus. Uh, so this is important because it means when blood is being squirted out of the aortic valve, the coronary arteries are actually blocked off by these valve leaflets, by these cusps. And when do the coronary valves, when do the coronary arteries fill? They fill during diastole when these valves close and these coronary sinuses are exposed to the diastolic pressure. The left coronary and the right coronary artery supply myocardium, and the right coronary mostly supplies right atrium, right ventricle, a little bit of the left ventricle. There's a posterior descending artery, which supplies the intraventricular septum and the inferior wall. That's usually a branch of the right coronary, but sometimes it's a branch of the left, depending on how patients are made. The left coronary artery um, supplies the left atrium and the ventricle, and it bifurcates into the left anterior descending, the LAD, and the circumflex arteries, um, which supply ventricular septum, anterior wall, and lateral wall. The SA node can be supplied by the RCA or the LAD, either one. And the AV node can be supplied by the RCA or the circumflex. All of the blood that the coronary arteries supply to the heart is then drained back into the heart, either through the coronary sinus or the cardiac veins or the Thebesian veins. So this blood is returned to the circulation on the venous side to be pumped to the lungs and reoxygenated. Because the coronary arteries are sort of embedded in the heart wall, every time the heart squeezes, it impedes the flow of the coronary circulation. And so what we see is that coronary perfusion is intermittent um, and your eight and uh, doesn't occur during all of the heart cycle, but is actually minimized during systole and occurs mostly during diastole. And also, as we saw before, arterial diastolic pressure really determines your myocardial blood flow um, even more than your mean pressure because we saw how the coronary sinuses are opened during diastole. How does the body control coronary blood flow? Well, when there's hypoxia, uh, the coronary arteries vasodilate due to a bunch of different molecules in the blood, including adenosine or nitric oxide, and that leads to increased perfusion of the heart by delivering more blood. We also have an autonomic effect, which is sort of indirect. Uh, when there's a sympathetic response, so the heart's going to need more oxygen, so that leads to increased heart rate and increased contractility, which leads to increased metabolism, and that also leads to coronary dilation. So when there's a stress, the, the heart's able to dilate its coronary arteries to increase coronary blood flow. And there's also a direct autonomic effect. Um, the sympathetic response leads to stimulation of beta receptors more than alpha receptors, and this also leads to improved coronary perfusion.
most of the um, oxygen requirement of the coronary of, of the cardiac blood cells let's try that again most of the oxygen consumption of cardiac cells is pressure work the muscles are trying to generate pressure and so that's what makes them need a lot of oxygen the myocardial cells are actually very good at getting oxygen out of blood they can get about 65 percent of it out compare that with other tissues that only take about 25 percent of the oxygen out of the blood uh, under normal circumstances so when the heart is in a position where it needs to get more oxygen or when the blood is not well oxygenated it can't really increase its extraction uh, so the heart rate really determines your oxygen supply but also your oxygen demand what's the effect of anesthetic agents on our myocardial oxygen balance well we know that they do cause coronary vasodilation and they do cause a little bit of anesthesia of the heart you could say so there isn't as much metabolic requirement um, but they also reduce arterial blood pressure they decrease your preload and your afterload uh, so there's a little bit of a balance in both directions we also know that there's something called reperfusion injury um, the heart could be ischemic and then when oxygen is restored to the heart there can actually be some damage from that reperfusion um, and myo and we see that anesthetic agents may give some protection against reperfusion injury so the relationship between anesthetic agents and myocardial oxygen balance is rather complicated We talk a lot about supply and demand when we discuss myocardial oxygen balance. And I like this table because it really reminds us of some of the things that might or might not be in our control when we talk about, is the heart getting enough blood supply to meet its oxygen demands? So what, su what factors affect the supply of oxygen to the heart? Well, heart rate, because more heart rate means more delivery. Our coronary perfusion pressure, so we want to have enough pressure in the arteries. And that's partially due to aortic diastolic pressure and also our ventricular and diastolic pressure. How much oxygen is in the blood that's being delivered to the heart? So that's our arterial oxygen content. That's affected by the hemoglobin concentration and the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. And then the coronary vessel diameter, which is talking about coronary artery disease. As those vessels get narrow, it becomes harder to supply adequate oxygen to the coronary muscles sorry to the cardiac muscles and then there are things that can increase demand so as heart rate goes up the heart needs more oxygen same with increased basal metabolic requirements so now we have more oxygen demand in the body meaning that the heart has to work harder to deliver oxygen to tissues uh, wall tension how much um, how much pressure are those ventricular walls generating and preload can have an effect on that as well as afterload contractility how hard is the heart working shivering when the body shivers it uses a tremendous amount of muscle energy and needs a lot of oxygen so these are all things that increase demand this is just a quick uh, diagram that lets us look at what happens during surgery that could lead to an imbalance in myocardial oxygen supply versus demand so for example a patient's having a stress response um, causing metabolic changes and increasing tissue oxygen demand or perhaps a patient's stress response leads to increased heart rate and blood pressure which once again increases their oxygen demand patients post-op and they're having shivering and that increases their oxygen demand uh, we can also decrease oxygen delivery so the inflammatory response could make them hypercoagulable um, and they could have a blood clot or an embolus which would uh, block the coronary arteries and that would decrease oxygen delivery or a plaque ruptures in a patient who has coronary disease and it leads to myocardial infarction again decreased oxygen delivery uh, we can also have patients who have a decreased hematocrit or decreased blood pressure uh, these can happen due to anesthesia or bleeding or some combination of them uh, we have an airway problem and or a lung problem and then we have hypoxia all of these things are going to decrease oxygen delivery so you can see um, lots of factors that go into the uh, balance between oxygen supply and oxygen demand in the perioperative period and in italics this, sh this chart shows a lot of different treatments that we could try to initiate in order to modulate some of these problems let's stop here as always please let me know if you have any questions
and we'll continue again with the next recording.